the we're running a very uh, low budget operation for the H three viewership podcast. Yeah, why not? And you don't have to. You the got, audience there. Yeah, you got the audience is there need, already. So, yeah, know. yeah. We have to do all this rigmarole because we started out of nowhere, from scratch. So <laughs> well, you already like, had it too. It's like I when you no, we ex- built this. Oh, you did? Yeah, just for we the built podcast. this for the podcast. This whole. Wow. This was an empty room. It used to be our altar call room. And then we moved our, our kind of next steps digitally. So um, this we put carpet in here, and then we built this whole thing for this podcast. Who's, and then and the who's, signs change depending on which podcast right. it is. Who's listening? Who's primary listener for this show? Um, uh, age category would be anywhere between 20 and 40. Okay. Um, uh, Christians. Christians. Kind, yeah, kind of. Yes and no. Yeah. Uh, 60%. Uh, male, forty okay. percent female. So we have a pretty even split, which is not common in podcasting. Normally, it's male, or or it, or it's if it's a crime thriller, then it's gonna have women on it. You know, it's gonna have high women. So that's pretty much what it's. But we have we have people in their sixties watching, and we we have all the data through Chartable and stuff like that. So it is a very diverse group that listen to this. Yeah, a bunch um, of my where am I gonna where am I gonna to where am I going to just explode because of this conversation? This guy, there. Your Instagram. No, no, no. There's no, some, where, where, yeah. like what people group around the world or in America? Oh, that I that I currently have. They're like, who is this clown? And then now I'm gonna. It's gonna like pop. Un- unchurched. Unchurched. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, like post Christian people. Yeah. It's interesting. I was hoping like I could be, you know, the, the. Oh, that you want to be the. the, 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 the you want to be? Yeah, the, I want to uh, be the <laughs> Craig Rochelle of Korea. <laughs> <laughs> or I want to be the, I want to be the Andy Stanley of the Hispanic world. Or I want to be yeah, the, you, the I Stephen Furtick. I, I, uh, I get pulled aside a lot because of this podcast. You do? I mean, people from our church, a good amount, are tuning in every time. And then wow. when I'm on the streets, it happens pretty pretty often. At least a couple times a month, where it's almost like, oh, I, I, I watched the Beyond the Letter. Da, 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 da. It's crazy. Yeah, my craziest one was I, I was like 45 minutes away in a grocery store, people and are, a girl peeps over and she goes. Do you, are you on radio? <laughs> and I said, no. She said, you're not on radio. I said, I said, no, I'm not on radio. She goes, I know your voice. Do you do something with audio? And I said, she heard, I mean, she I, have heard a, you, I have a podcast. Yeah. And then she was like, well, what's it called? And I was like, uh, beyond the letter. It's like a Christian podcast. And she was like, yes, that's what it's from. My friend sent it to me last week. I recognize your voice in the grocery aisle. And then I said, oh, do you? Do you go to a, have you ever been to Abundant Living? You've been to our church? She's like, What's that? You have a church? I said, Yeah, yeah. She was like, What's that? And then I was like, Oh, are you a Christian? She's like, I mean, no. Yeah. Is, is, this is so different, <laughs> so different from like our standard Christian evangelical leadership podcast. Yeah. Cause like probably, trying not to exaggerate, around a dozen people in our church have told me my boss and my coworkers are sharing your wow. clips. And they had no yeah. idea you're my pastor. And it's wow. not Chris, it's not the Christian clips. It's like just random yeah. clips about it's great. About yeah. culture, about politics, yeah. or about diversity, or about relationships. And they're like, Yeah, my boss was sharing. I went up to my boss and was like, Hey, are you a Christian? He's like, No, nah, I'm nice. Oh, okay. You just shared a <laughs> clip of my pastor on your Instagram. Huh. That guy's a pastor? You know, they're like, <laughs> wait. Because <laughs> the way that Adam and the team run it, it's very Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's good. The way we phrase it is like we, we want to be the front door to faith. Um, so we want people to find, uh, a conversation of faith through engaging with oh, our content. And there was, uh, in particular, there, there was like, look at you. I know. Look, she bought the whole bottle. Oh Nancy cracks that out every Sunday she before does. I preach. So it's like, yeah, secondhand. That let's talk up. about Nancy for a second. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Let's talk about how great Nancy is. She was in marketing at Monster. How much is Adam oh. paying you, Nancy, currently? <laughs> I'm, Brad's I, gonna try to hire Brad, you after this, yeah. so just you ever fear, shoot you high. ever thought about going to Tulsa, Oklahoma? <laughs> <laughs> Tulsa's never. <laughs> Tulsa's becoming the cultural epicenter. What of, do the single men look like in Tulsa, <laughs> Oklahoma? Mm, That's skittish. The question. Skittish. Oh, she's not interested. <laughs> yeah, skittish. Aww. Yeah, skittish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's trying to fill that uh, that left hand. I've never had as many snacks as I have in the in the place that I'm. We snacking. What are you saying? At at like a. Apartment slash, it's like a hotel. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, like like a a condo. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the snack game is on point. It's next level. The snack, hey, and listen, never, as a as somebody who travels, are we recording? Because I want her yeah, to be honored recording. by this. Yeah, we've been but recording. I, as somebody yeah. who travels, yeah. you know that is that that's honoring 
when you actually are like, wait, you have the snacks that I like, but also you just were intentional about, you know, having some things there that make you feel like you're at home. Oh yeah, Nancy texts me every week, like, "Do you want a drink?" And I'm, but then I'm like, "Water's good," <laughs> but she still checks it every week. Will's like, always like, "I'm fasting and praying." <laughs> In order to get through that podcast without being canceled next week, I got it's a too fast late. leading up it's to... It's too late. I've been canceled a hundred times. I don't believe in cancel culture no more as a result of this podcast. So many people have tried to cancel me from this. you faced your inner demons. <laughs> it's all yeah. good. It's yeah. not, it's, you can't, you can't cancel un, me. You're uncancelable. Yeah. It's, just, it's just not... I don't think it's real no more. I, yeah. I, for a season, I was oh, this, this is kind of like really happening but now i'm like that's not real it yeah just... your first couple episodes you would text after and say hey man i, I you know i said this can you guys cut it or i did yeah, this can yeah. you cut it and then now you don't <laughs> you don't ask for nothing to get cut i just I, whenever i share stories and stories you get better people, at self-filtering the more you do it too yeah um i've you, definitely you got don't you you just start recording i'm yes. guessing with guests Correct. With everyone. Every week. Everybody. You start recording. Start recording. Start, recording. start so the conversation. Better. Start so the better. flow. Yeah. Compared to, okay, we're going to now start and everybody puts the radio voice on. Three, and then two, one, go. All yeah, the good so, stuff uh, is before after. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So and I, then somewhere around this time, we'll say, hey, everybody, welcome to Beyond the Letter. Everyone, we got the usual suspects in the house today. We got Will, who's co-hosting with me today. Dang, and dang. we have one of our friends and really a mentor in our life. Brad Lominick. If you've never heard of Brad Lominick, a legend, now you know, a we, guru. Put, we are putting you on game. Leader of the Christian Illuminati. Mm. He runs the Christian church. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, can I add something before you guys go oh, on? Go, yeah. Nancy. Okay, See, and so, anyone could jump in. Yeah, I just want to say thank you, Brad. That was so kind, but I definitely can't do it without Phil and Ashley, who gave Listen. pointers. So I, it's not a one person thing. Phil's the grand poobah. <laughs> yeah, grand yeah, poobah yeah. of hospitality yeah. and of hosting. Man, dude. Feels the man. Arguably top five hosts in all yeah. the world. And he does other stuff, but. Ooh, Phil is always imp- like impresses whoever we get to host. And his golf game his, is strong as well. He talked himself down leading he lo- up to he low balled. He low balled his golf uh, level. And then you see him, he's hitting 250 yard drives and throwing chips Straight. three feet away from the pin. Are you a golfer? No. Nah, okay. Nah, Sorry. I should golf, <laughs> <Yeah>. but. <laughs> It's a conversation we have pretty regularly to try to get him out. Even on the drive here, my, my boy Jonathan was like, are you going to golf people? Or when are you going to start playing golf? It's in my blood. It's in my heritage. I thought all pastors, it was, it was in the, is in the, the job description. Yeah, you especially to, if you're Korean. It's like you, if you you're Korean golf. and you're a pastor and you're Christian, like if you don't golf, like you're. That, that Venn diagram just says yeah. golf. Yeah, but not Well, this he guy. falls in the category of all pastors because all pastors either golf or smoke cigars. So I chose the latter. He chose the second. That's what he did. Can we, we talk about cigar golf. smoking for a second? Yeah, you. Yeah, it's a fair game, <laughs> fair game well, conversation. So if I if I rate or I put a priority on the on the areas of tobacco for Christians, uh, obviously cigar smoking is somewhat it, it's somewhat approved in most circles. Yeah, yeah is that a fair in, statement in America. Yes, in America, in, in many in many of the conservative reform circles that is pretty hand in hand yeah it's kind of like yeah. you have to are you correct you you just do it yeah now let's go presbyterian to s- church that type of stuff your c- cigars and beer is likened to charles spurgeon and anyone else it's it's it's, <laughs> spurgeon, it's just Lewis. hand in hand and whenever whenever cigars get brought up on this statement i remind people that when dl moody criticized spurgeon for smoking too many cigars do you know sir do you know spurgeon's response no his, he, Moody held an open rebuke to Spurgeon and said he smokes too much cigars. He's not taking care of his temple. In which Charles Spurgeon responded and said, your overweightness, your food intake is too much. Take that. And, and then Spurgeon says, DL. Spurgeon says, I have never abused cigars. Cigar <laughs> abuse would be smoking two cigars at one time. And I've never done that before. <laughs> and that's what Charles Spurgeon says. I, I've had people, I've had like genuine people out of like being a little stumbled, like message me on social media, like people that I have discipled or not even disciple people that like who have followed my ministry and they'll long message of appreciation and at the way in they would say, but I'm just so confused why you smoke cigars. Hmm. And I just, when I do respond, which is almost never, I just say, I smoke cigars for the same reason why you eat chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> and that translates? And I just say it makes me very happy and I or enjoy McDonald's it. Or McDonald's yeah, or anything Or anything. Yeah. And it's c- yeah. or cigarettes. Now, where do we put cigarettes yeah. in the in the a tough one. in the hierarchy here? Yeah, I don't smoke cig. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's. I wouldn't necessarily say it's a sin. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And what about like a good, you know, beech nut 
chewing tobacco. Yeah. Like a, you know. Yeah. Or, or what skull. all the kids are getting into is those Zins. The z- yeah. yeah. Little, little pack. I think, I think everything. Pretty, I don't know nothing about all that, but. I think everything could be debated and argued about. But I think for me, my, my, I guess, compass of decision making and things like this is like, does it add value to my life in a way that honors God? That's, that's okay. Yeah, I think that's just kind of yeah. how it's filtered too. And you want to be careful that you don't justify, you could say that by anything. Well, I sleep around with people because it helps me feel, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you could say a lot Closer of things. To God. Yeah, so for me, it's like, does this thing that may be neutral, and if I use it in a way that allows me to draw close to God and it adds joy to my life in Christ, I mm. think it's fair game. And I think anything, good or bad, could be taken advantage of. And a good thing could become a God thing and become an idol. So you have to always be careful and be mindful. Do you, would you do you think do you think anything that is addiction is potentially sinful or has the propriety to get you to sin regularly? Mm. Anything that's addiction. I think I think yes and no. I, I do think there are some addictions that are good for you in the sense of like some people are literally addicted to reading the Bible. Like literally their brain or chemistry exercise. or yeah. exercise, right? I think the question is, is it over obsessive? Mm-hmm. And does it take over your life? For example, even being addicted to ministry or being addicted right. to Christian things could become a sin, right? Like the Pharisees. So in the mm-hmm. same way, anything good or bad. So yes, to your question, the answer is yes. Or it could also be a good thing in the sense that you know how to, you know how to, I guess, I don't, I don't I hate the word manage. Because do you think addiction is ever held to, not held to a standard in which you tend to outside outside of a chemical addiction like like cigarettes or something like that we could say that's not a real addiction it's a very abusive addiction because it there's a chemical imbalance that's the nicotine is leading you to cons- consistently crave yes. it okay so if we separate like a drug or alcohol abuse that maybe inhibits your chemical and, and creates a drive for it we just talk about anything else that is a a decisive quality of addiction can you think of any type of addiction where it doesn't lead to um, self-judging others for not holding themselves to the same standard of your level of addiction? Because commonly, like you said, someone that's addicted to reading the Bible. I've rarely met someone who's addicted to reading the Bible that isn't projecting an expectation that everyone that's else right. ought to be as well. That's true. You or, know? They're, or they're trying to level up and yeah. want everybody to know that they're reading the Bible. The mm-hmm. Daily Post or yeah. whatever that is, right? Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. So I that's wonder what I that stuff, what it always, because people always want to reverse engineer sin and like you take Jesus' statement, reverse engineer, like, so I say, if you so much as look at a woman with lust, you sure. have committed adultery. He's talking about like the inception of the decision which leads to the sin, you know? For sure. I mean, that's a good question. <clears throat> I... I don't, I don't know if you have a response to that, but I definitely have a question in the line to I don't addiction. have an answer. I'm just, I'm just, uh, I was throwing some nuggets I, out there. I wanted to ask Brad, as we're yes. ta- this is random, but as we're talking about this, being an individual, and you know, if you don't know Brad Laman, just Google him. Uh, <laughs> it'll tell you nothing. It'll tell but, you everything. But, but for both of us to say he's one of our mentors in life, that yeah. we wouldn't say that I don't that too actually often. know what pops number one on Google right now. I should probably... Yeah. But I, the, talk the, the reason why I was going to ask you... Because Brad's spending majority of your time with high capacity leaders, I would say with national influence to even global influence. What are perhaps some addictions that you find leaders finding themselves into more than maybe the common person from your experience? In, with that particular group? Yeah. Really per- high capacity high people capac- that are carrying that? a lot of weight? Yeah. It, I mean, it would be the usual suspects. So I would say addiction to to validation or that I've that I finally get to sit at the cool kids table, mm. uh, success addiction to success, to addiction to work or uh, overwork, burnout. So the the actual like feeling that I get of of value from from doing my craft well. Mm. So uh, I think there's an addiction probably with most high capacity people to also. There's there's usually one vice that is your kryptonite. Mm. Now, again, that, that's true for everybody, but especially high capacity people, there's one area of their life where they are more prone to addiction. Mm. And that's so that part of self awareness is then navigating that and being aware of it and then 
nav- and and putting things in place that will keep you from killing the thing or crushing or destroying the thing that you're trying to build. Hmm. And that could be that I have an addiction to pornography or I have an addiction to alcohol or I have an addiction to to tobacco. Hmm. And it it quickly can go from I hang out and have a cigar with friends to now I can't actually go to sleep at night mm. without three glasses of wine. Mm. And that's a real quick, <laughs> we think that takes a long time, but sometimes that feels yeah. almost like it's overnight. Mm. So That's insightful because you just shared a lot of these high capacity, quote unquote, world changers are addicted to like success. Oh, and they're all insecure. <clears throat> Unpack that a little bit. The three of us, let's just let's assume that we fit in the category of somewhat uh, successful and high capacity and doing some things that hopefully are making a difference in the world. We're all we're all three of us are insecure. Depending on what room we're in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what people think is when you arrive, when you're like the goat, that you no longer are insecure. No, you're actually more insecure. Wow. When you get to the top of the food chain and look around and go, we were talking about this this morning. I hope nobody knows that I have no idea what I'm doing. (laughs) (laughs) I hope nobody figures it out. I'm winging it half the time. I'm winging it half the time. (laughs) I've never been here before. I'm not here like making a decision that nobody has the playbook for. Hmm. And that's the, that's the pain, but also the man, the beauty of, of, of success and of, of chasing something. Wow. Um, And you can't all shucks that, but you also have to be aware that that's where, that's where the, the, the clarity of self-awareness, of authenticity, of transparency and vulnerability, all those things that make you more honest as a leader, that everybody looks at you and goes, we're here to help you. Mm. We're not here to like throw you under the bus because you don't know the answer. Mm. We're actually here to help you get to the next level. But we, we tend to start thinking we should know the answer. Mm. I'm concerned about the person who knows the answer. Or they think that they know the answer in that seat. Mm. And I hope you do, but lots of times my answer is, I don't really know. What do you think? Yeah. What, when, what, what was the last space or atmosphere that genuinely made you most nervous, whether it be a person mm, you met question. or space you were in? Gosh, good question. Oh. Uh, well, I mean, I, I feel it when I'm around people who I look up to in general. I would say it most recently... I'm trying to do more stuff in the corporate space. Mm. And um, I won't say like names or companies or people, but I'm walking into those environments and nobody knows who I am. No, nobody has a clue. Like who's, who let the clown in? And, uh, and I'm trying to be an advisor in that space. So in the Christian world, in the Christian leadership world, you know, I've, I've, yeah, I've got a lot. Half of, the time, everyone knows a jest of yes. Okay, so, but some of those corporate spaces, I'm I'm walking in and having to not only um, try to figure out how do I gain influence in this room, but actually how do I how do I show up and add value immediately, and even my the way I do what I do has to change mm-hmm. based on the rules of engagement, mm-hmm. and that could be things I say, it could be it could be jokes I have, and John Maxwell taught us 20 years ago about this. When, he, when John was going from the church to the corporate space, he said, I love the challenge of walking into these new rooms and having to figure out how I gain influence with this new audience. Mm. And most of us were like, really, John? Like, that sounds like a lot of work. And I, <laughs> now I'm sitting in that same space and I'm kind of going, this is awesome. Because it's, you, you have to like, you, it feels like you're showing up to a new school. Yeah. When, you, when you transfer to that new school and you have no friends, and now how do you actually show up and not just to get invited to the cool kids table with all the athletes or the nerds or the, you know, the computers or the, but how do I gain influence with this entire ninth grade mm-hmm. yeah. at this new middle, at this new middle school or high school? So I feel like I'm in that space yeah. and it makes me incredibly like yeah. insecure, but also like really excited. What might help some people is like, let's just say, cause I think someone who, you know, graduates college and goes into their first job or whatever could re- could relate to this in the same way. But many of us too, like I know there's many times 
like I remember the first time I got asked by a, a corporate gig to come and do some like staff culture stuff. And I felt like as I was preparing it, it was like, uh, I'm not talking to Christians. I'll be like, some are going to be Christians, but most aren't. And right. I'm not being brought in as pastor. I'm bringing, being brought in as a, a guy who, you know, motivates teams and blah, 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 blah. So there was this a massive amount of insecurity that was just like, I know I'm going to fumble the ball. And I think someone going into their first job that maybe is a dream job or stepping into a role like a promotion. I'm, you know, I talk to people all the time who are like, moving into management for the first time. They yeah. faithfully was an employee for so many years and now they get to be over 10, 12 people and there's this natural insecurity that goes, like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. What would you say on the front end is the best way to prepare for that so that when that insecurity rises, you can lean on pre preparation, mm -hmm. but also give yourself grace to fall or make mistakes? Like, posture what, 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 what posture of curiosity. Mm -hmm. That's it. Walk in, walk in, just be and be really curious. Um, and that that's good question asking. It's 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 <laughs> allowing other people to be the to be the people that talk. Um, we think we have to show up and 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 again validate us being in the room by just yapping. Yeah, yapping will make people <laughs> lose. It makes you lose credibility. Many yeah, times. Was it a proverb? Even, even the is that, a, is that even the, what is, I, is that was that in the message? Even the, message the wise, version? even yeah, the quiet yeah. person is wise, right? Or the, yeah, 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 the yeah. fool who talks, you know. Yeah, yeah. And you're not quiet because you're you're not engaged. You're quiet because you're allowing other people to be the center of attention. Mm. And that that is a that's a superpower, but it's a it's a leadership hack. And again, anytime you walk into a place where you, nobody knows you. The best way for them, for them, for you to walk away from a conversation and them to go, who was that again? Mm. I like them. Is for you to just yeah. stir it up, stir it up, and allow people to to talk, allow people to feel like they belong in the conversation. So, but our tendency always is to show up and try to prove ourselves. Prove ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Say more. You're, you know, I gotta, I gotta tell everybody that I'm the expert. Um, so that's that's one for yeah. sure is is just become a really good student yeah. in that situation. And we think if we're – so here's a, here's a, here's a tip, because a lot of young leaders, young or old, but young leaders will ask this question. Um, I'm 33, Brad. Um, I just got promoted to a VP role in this company that I work in, in Columbus, Ohio. It's a, it's a, we have 300 people on our staff, and I've got a team of 20 people – and they're all older than me. And I'm yeah. 32, but, but I'm really good at what I do. But all these people who've been here for 20 years plus look at me and they go, who let the punk in? Mm. And why do I have to listen to you? Even though you're now in charge of me. Yeah. So how do I show up in that first day of that role and actually get those 20 people who are older than me to, to want to follow me? I would say you show up and go, hey, let's put the elephant on the table, and let's all address it. I am young. I'm younger than every one of you here. You all have been here way longer. The average tenure in this room is, is 17 years at this company. I've been here for, for 18 months, and somebody decided that I should be in charge. Now, we can argue about that, but let me tell you what I need from you. I would like for you to help me help you. Thank you, Jerry Maguire. <laughs> help me help you. What does that mean? That I'm going to help me help you. I need your help to actually lead you. I need you to, to see me as a project that you're going to help me be a better leader based on lots of ways that you can now contribute and add value to my journey. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to remove this idea that it's, it's us, it's, it's you all against me or it's me against you. No, we're on the same side now. Mm. So if I allow that person to see their role as their, they're going to now mentor me equally as much as be on my team, that person looks at me and goes, okay, I, I think I might want to lean in a bit more and help you succeed here. Compared to a lot of young leaders show up and they, they try to, again, they try to validate that they belong mm. in the seat. And that looks like many times over-indexing on making sure that you know that I'm a really big deal yeah. and that I'm the super kid. And that just makes me more annoyed by you <laughs> yeah. as a 54 year old, right? Yeah. So just that, that slight shift on the dial can change yeah. everything in terms of 
those that team being for you compared to that team looking around going, well, we just have to buy our time because this young buck is going to be gone in six months anyway. Mm. So we'll just put up with them. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. We, t- we talked about it on this podcast quite a few times. You said it earlier. And uh, we know that the next generation, Gen Z, and probably ultimately Gen Alpha, is going to operate in the course of their life to have 20 to 30 uh, really either career moves or job moves. Yeah. Um, which, like, there are a lot, there's benefits to that. That's like, oh, okay, you get entrepreneur, you get to find your spot, yeah, blah, blah, blah. But then there's also the disadvantage that I think not many people are talking about, which is like a lack of futuring with retirement and, you know, what that could look like and, you know, not f- settling down until you're in your late 40s and then you feel like life has already passed. And so, you said it earlier, even with some of our leadership team, like what do you think are truly some of the positives and also the warning signs of a young person who's like might be listening to this and going like, I got 20 things that I want to do. I want to be a YouTuber. I want yes. to help a tech startup. I also, I'm at Target right now. And I think I want to move up <laughs> in management at Target. But like, if that sucks, then I want to maybe go over here. But now I went from Target to now I'm, I'm leading a store at Jamba Juice. But while I'm on Jamba Juice, I'm also learning how to code, like, because I think I might want to go into real estate. Somebody at Jamba you know? Juice just spit their Jamba Juice <laughs> yeah, out because right? they're like, wait, you're reading my mail. <laughs> exactly. Adam, you're reading, totally reading my mail. Because that's just majority of my conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a, a, yeah. pop, a blog post and a oh, yeah. podcast <laughs> on its way yeah. to help people. And they're coaching. You know, they have courses. Yeah. Exactly. They have courses and they, they're coaching and they're 24. Yeah. yeah. Right. I've got a, I got a master class at 24. Exactly. I'll teach you how to yeah. public speak. Yeah. You know. Uh, well, so let's, I'm gonna. I want to ask y'all. I mean, let's ask uh, some of the wonder wonder well, kids over here behind the behind the yeah, uh, behind. We the, got Andy. The, we got uh, Jonathan in here. What did Alize step out? We got Alize step out. <laughs> and Nancy's like, let me tell you how to turn the mic on. No, I mean well, what for you, real. Andy, oh, you, hey, Andy you've got heard the mic. What you gonna say, bro? Andy, <laughs> Andy, you've heard us talk about this at least maybe a dozen times. So and you and you and you help uh, cut the podcast for socials. So. Mm-hmm. Like what? What are your thoughts when we when we talk about this? And Pro- because- and it's and it's project generation. Yes. Gig economy. Yes. I've got I fourteen. So I got fourteen revenue streams. Yeah. Yeah. I, for sure. I, I, I'm I'm gonna have seven jobs by the time I'm twenty nine. Yeah. Everybody looks yeah. at me and says you're disloyal. You jump. It gets hard. You have one hard conversation. It's peace out. Yeah. Yes. And to give you some context of of Andy here. Andy here. Andy, you're not. Are you eighteen yet? Yeah, I just turned. 18. You just turned eighteen. Yeah. So. He's been on our team now for about a year and a half. He started about 16 youth student, and he was cutting uh, streaming for uh, streamers. Hello. Uh, like in our youth ministry, but he did it outside. And I think you, you could correct me or wrong, give more of the story, but like our junior high director, who's now Jermaine, who's yeah. our creative director, was like, how much are these guys paying you to cut their whole streams? Yeah. And he's like, oh, 20 bucks for like a three-hour stream? Mm-hmm. I would do them for free too, like a few times. I was doing it for free for like, six months and Jermaine's like bro and they were like good oh yeah you know you yeah. see our stuff now it's great yeah and uh that's the magic that's the magic sauce right there. Jermaine's bro. like hey we can like we can help you clear how to tell a story through cutting like right. that's something we can do because it was like they were great but they were like they were they they were they didn't really tell a story so it's like why don't you come help us with the podcast we'll we'll, we'll, we'll help you do what we do. He also gets mentorship now with like Corey, who was mentored yep. by Quentin Tarantino. So expanded his horizons to now uh, Andy's on the team and he's cutting on the team at 18, but he started with us at 16. Um, so the, he's now been probably consistently in a career longer than most yes. 25 year olds. At this a, point, by the way, you know? talk. And, yeah. a, and a bunch of us old fogies are sitting around in, you know, in leather in mahogany rooms talking about all these kids today. Yeah. And they, what they're, what they're saying is, well, you, you, you didn't, you're not mowing lawns like I did growing up, but mm-hmm. it's the taught same thing. Taught himself how to cut and edit. Yeah. Taught himself how to cut and edit. Yeah. So the entrepreneurial spirit or the ability for me to like find the thing or to move towards the thing that I'm, you know, that, that might turn into a career is still there. It just looks different for so many younger leaders because the outlets of it, mm-hmm. you know, even the whole influencer thing. Like we get, I get annoyed by how many kids want to be an influencer. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, who created this system? We did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's our fault. Yeah. But keep going on. Yeah. Cause it, this is, this is going to help a lot of people in terms of yeah. the practical side of it's this great. too. And if I'm not right, did, did you, 
did did your parents move you to homeschooling to continue to do what you're doing right now because they believed in it if i'm not i started I'm not... homeschooling when i was in third grade so okay. i was homeschooling first okay but then i started like this whole like i wanted to continue to edit i started doing it at 14 so it was like that's when i got into it so homeschooling helped me a lot with like making more time for to pursue that because like i can rework my schedule so like i'm here now on like during a school day be yeah doing school yeah. So homeschooling helps with me to pursue that more. So I'm like, this kind of works out too. So what was in your mind <clears throat> as you're editing? Like your inner dialogue is, I'm serving God. I want to work hard. This is a stepping stone. This is what I love. I just want to add value. Do you have an inner dialogue as you're doing Beyond the Letter? Yeah, like it's, it started off as a hobby. And like I genuinely love doing editing and telling stories like that, building like – um videos and watching it back like when i can't watch a video now or a reel without analyzing it hmm. so like that's every time i'm watching it i'm like oh that's i like that sound i like how they made the text pop and like that so doing beyond the letter yeah i always like i at first i started with like doing youtubers and then um jermaine asked me to do youth and then i was like uh, just last year i was like you know what? i think i want to move from doing like just editing random youtube pranks to like full-on helping the church with like beyond the letter and so, yeah, I like doing, like, with the church. That's something I felt like God really called me to do, especially last year. Okay, let's like, let, can, I, can I paint context here? Go this ahead. Is, this is really good. When we start talking about what am I supposed to do with my life, because a lot of people listening to this podcast, they're navigating that question. 100%. Yeah. What am I, what, even if I'm in a good job, it pays me a bunch, or I'm, I'm struggling, or I feel lost, what am I supposed to do with my life? By the way, what you just heard from Andy was a whole bunch of breadcrumbs on the path to finding his calling. Yeah. And I heard multiple in there. You, you ask him, well, like, what do you, you know, what do you love about editing? Mm-hmm. He, he said two or three things that are, that are expressions of intrinsic wiring that God put in him, mm-hmm. DNA, the things he loves, he wakes up wanting to do, probably something he could probably get paid at. Yeah. And then also, hopefully, as a follower of Jesus that it does contribute to God's story, mm-hmm. you know, in the current season you're in. Mm-hmm. But for, for him to now take those breadcrumbs and turn that into a, a, future, a direction for his life is actually way closer than he thinks it is. And you, yeah. Andy, you may be so on point with your sense of purpose and calling and the direction that you're going, but this is the struggle for so many people is we try to, we make it too hard. Yeah. We're like, listen, at the end of the day, God really doesn't want you to figure this out. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a journey you're going to go on and you're never going to find the answer. Mm. Only a few of us do, and most of us, the only people who ever do is those of us in full time ministry. Well, that's hogwash. Yeah. So everybody has something, a, a, a statement, a phrase, a bullet points that can give them that sense of of riverbanks mm-hmm. on their life, mm-hmm. and that's what's missing. And the more seasons of assignment, yeah. twenty to twenty five different seasons of jobs or career changes or whatever, that actually makes the, the calling so much more important. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. otherwise, I'm just, I'm just jumping from thing to thing without like, any connection point. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Where like my dad or my grandfather, had, he had one job <laughs> in one industry for 50 years. That's like yeah. my dad right now. Whether he loved it or hated it, yep. give me to the weekend, mm-hmm. give me a retirement. Finally, I'm 65, now I can go do whatever I want. My dad had one, one industry, one career. I'm going to have six or seven different seasons of assignment, but Andy's going to have 20 to maybe now he might have one, but yeah. all of his friends are going to have 20 to 25 mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I think I feel free to chime in. Like, I mean, I didn't mind our millennial pastoring a lot of Gen Z students. Right. And I thought we were the same, but we're different, very different. And the way that I feel like it started with probably Xers, but more to millennials, even more so to Gen Z, because of so many opportunities and social media. The temptation is to walk into doors that you're not prepared to walk into, right? Yeah. And the, what I there's a thing I developed, and a lot of it was inspired by Robert Clinton, but I call it the five stages of lasting influence or lasting uh, leadership. First stage is character. The second stage is craft. The third stage is capacity. The fourth stage is convergence. And the fifth stage is contribution. Oh, C, five Cs. Yeah, that's preacher talks, right? <laughs> so on, my thing Indian is... student for you. So like, you know, character is... Striving. Say, those, say those again. Character, craft, 
capacity, convergence, contribution. Mm. But I think a lot of young people, we try to skip, right? So I say yeah. character is striving to become like Christ in every area of your lives. And the test is integrity and faithfulness, right? And then craft is developing your full potential to add value in God's kingdom and to other people. And the, and the, 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 what you got to overcome there is hard work. Right. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's experience. But then if you will work on your character and your craft, God's the one who opens your capacity, right? But the temptation is to always jump through loops and find different opportunities and you cut short God developing you. Mm. Um, pe- preachers always say this, uh, David killed hundreds of lions and bears before he killed Goliath, Hello. right? Success is when opportunity meets preparation. And David was propelled. That'll tweet. Right? I don't even know. I'm sure. That'll someone, X. Someone yeah. said that somewhere. That's going to hit That'll in X. Korea. That's going to go off in Seoul. I was saying in Korea, but I'll <laughs> yeah, put yeah, my people yeah. to shame. But I think. <laughs> it probably don't rhyme in Korean. Yeah, it would have rhymed, right? <laughs> but I feel like that's the testing you have to go through. Yeah. And that's the testing that I feel like anyone who is successful at a level of convergence and contribution, they all went through those stages. Yes. And they put in their reps. They put in they put in the hours when no one saw. And their heart was not motivated necessarily to be seen. Hmm. It was to add value. And wherever you add value and wherever you add solutions, there are going to be opportunities. But if you keep jumping and jumping and jumping and jumping, it will just prolong your wilderness season where you don't really know what you're good at, what you're not good at. Right? Okay, how, do, how do I discover then what I'm good at? And, and obviously in my early yeah. first quarter of life, I want to develop character and craft yes right yeah but then how do i how do i how do i know oh well, you're actually really ga- great negotiator or you're really good at uh you know confrontation or you have this empathy and relational intelligence that is not normal for sure so find figuring out those things like how have you guys discovered that in your in your seasons yeah experimentate i mean yeah trying stuff yeah for, yeah, for me, it started off with trying stuff, and it started off is in starting like so. What now? Now I know as is is doing things, and then if something it does well or I find enjoyment, it's deconstructing that to say what is the root. Like you said with Andy, Andy said he loves the story. Yes, it, he loves the aspect of telling the story. So it's not that he loves editing. It's that he actually potentially is a really great storyteller, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's an element of strength where it can be expressed through editing. But that could be he could maybe if he explored it, he could express it in other ways. He could help companies tell stories. He could help individuals articulate. He could go into counseling and help people understand their story more. There's so many ways that that can uh, that that can implement. So like for me in trying stuff and when things went well or people say, hey, you're really good at that. What? I realized I was really good at is ideas in infancy. Hmm. Like I, I discovered like, wow, I'm real. I can learn culture really fast. Cause that's what happens when you take a Hispanic who grew up in a black church, who was like moving into the white church, who also married a black woman who like family was Hispanic, but it's like, you know, so I had to become a cultural translator really fast. And so you're like, oh, actually that, works a lot in business. Yes. People are trying to translate culture all the time with their product and who are they reaching? Mm. Who are, you know, one of my first opportunities I had with pray.com was they worked for two months on one particular project, which was uh, an aspect where they were going to give pastors, they were going to let people have a certain uh, uh, communication aspect with their pastor where basically there was going to be like a, it, it might be interesting now, but like 10 years ago, it wasn't where they basically, if someone messaged on the app, it was going to send a text message to their, their pastor where then he can respond to them. And, you know, what I was sharing with them at the time was like, pastors don't want our <laughs> people not, always texting yeah. us. Let we me actually, help you translate. Yeah, we, want our, <laughs> we want our people talking to each other. Yeah. You know, like that's when the church thrives and community thrives. And we would love to be a piece of that puzzle, but we don't want to be the picture of the puzzle. And I'm in the room and, and they're like, that's great project scratched and they had coded the whole project already. Hmm. It was ready to, it was going to go live the next week. And they were like, Hey, we're going to scratch it. That's great, Adam. And not only did that moment, did I learn like for companies that are highly excel- selling fast, you can't hold on to anything, right? Hmm. You know, hands open. 
you know, today, a, a decision today can totally ruin the company tomorrow. And they know that and they recognize that. And so in that moment, and then through other conversations, it was like, when companies were in the middle of a decision or, or in terms of the middle of something or at the end of something, I, I learned I like really didn't have a lot of value, but it was always early. the initial early mm-hmm. idea conception, mm. which then in our church has become a great strike because our church does a lot of like, uh, um, trend setting things, whether it be the way we had done baptism that many churches ended up taking from. And we took calls with a lot of the biggest churches in America to do baptism the way that we did or how we functioned some other things like church merch. We were one of the first churches to ever do church merch. And so I found like, oh, th- like, it's not that I'm a creative. It's I'm really good in a particular space, which is the startup space. And that's clarifying for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Because now I make decisions based off of... You know, that's your grid. Like, oh, that, yeah. That's what I can do. <clears throat> well, I feel, like, I feel like as, as we we're talking about this, in your career development in the early years is about your yes. But in your middle to latter years is about your no. Hello. And the reason why it's about your yes, even Andy, Andy did editing for free. Yeah. Because he's he, saying yes. Yeah, but what he, didn't, yes. what he didn't know was he was investing into his future, yes. right? Because when you're young, yeah. it's not about getting that paycheck. It's about getting experience, right. right? And if you think it's about the paycheck when you're too young, you're actually not going to be able to develop something to actually offer, right? You're opening the steam bath and letting the heat out too fast. So when, I, yep. when I'm around young people that I'm mentoring or discipling, even though I'm all about opportunities, like I'm like, yo, get the opportunity, but just be focused, be focused, and... Don't worry about getting paid and don't worry about getting exposure. Focus on getting reps. Yes. Get your reps Experiment. in. Experiment. Experiment. Yes. And so like reps. I, I, I shared this before on the podcast, you know, meeting you and meeting other people who are kind of like movers and shakers in the kingdom and even in society. When I first started getting around them, a lot of the phrase was, yo, Will, like, who are you? Where have you been at? Like, I, you, like you're yada, yada, yada. And I realized... Hey, I might be preaching in front of thousands of people right now, but this was all birthed when I was preaching in front of five kids Yes, for like five years. You were crock-potted. Yeah. So like even my boy Jonathan right here, he was my youth student when I was 18 was he years good? old. Hey, was he good, Jonathan, <laughs> at 18? Huh? Was he? Just, just say he was present. <laughs> he was, he was, there was, he was, he's what we needed. He let's was just, present. Let's just say a lot of things are taken out of context. <laughs> <laughs> so like he was 14, I was 18, yeah. and my Friday night service had like anywhere from three to five kids. Sunday was anywhere from eight to 12 kids, depending on that one family who had four siblings. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I'll be preaching, but what I didn't know back then was that was my gym. Hmm. That was yeah. the, the training field, ground. the training ground that God was developing and preparing me to be. So even when I see Andy, his first- And your content may have gotten better, yeah. but your passion and your care is, I would probably bet, is the same that it is today. Yes, you know? yes. Um, yes. And, 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 and that is what people, I don't think, always get. They say, oh, my passion and my care will increase the more my opportunities. Because right now I'm like 50-50. Yeah. It, and, it, you know, and, and, let's add, and let's also add in there, just to make sure people are aware, that you need to actually have a gifting Yes. You need to actually have some talent. I heard someone yeah. say, if your gift doesn't meet yeah. your passion, find another passion. <laughs> exactly. Because too many people are, are telling people, just chase your passion. That's bad. That's bad advice. Yes. Because you don't know what your passion is yet, especially when you're young. Yeah. Yeah. So getting exposure. I had a passion for wanting to play in, a, in the NFL. Yeah. But, <laughs> but my gifting was slow, white, <laughs> under, undersized, yeah, average, yeah. average, yeah. average athlete. But I want to say, passion for it. Though. I want to also say one thing to give Adam credit and the culture at Abundant Living is to give someone like Andy an opportunity. Yes, give them op- give them room to, to yeah. sit at the table. Because most leaders yeah. would have been like, he's too young. Yeah, keep him yeah. in the back. Put, pay- him, put him with the interns. Or yeah. Put him, yeah, put him with the youth group. Well, and I think here's where some leaders too um, can lose people is because the early conversation with Andy with Jermaine was. Uh, they had a small youth budget because they had never done anything. So they wanted to bring Andy on to cut some youth stuff. And then I started seeing it. I'm like, man, that's really good. And Jermaine goes, oh, man, if we start having them do church stuff, I mean, these guys pay him 20 bucks. We're paying like 40 bucks or whatever it was, 50 bucks. Like it'd be a big savings for the church. I said, oh, no, if he comes to the table, we're paying him fair market value. Yeah, Wait, that doesn't. No, if we make room on the table, we don't just because someone's younger. If, my, if, like, that's why he's they, my dog. They, <laughs> Like he's get, he's getting paid the fair yeah. per video that we would 
any other company it and that's it you know and Jermaine was like oh okay and I'm like because <laughs> I'm like it's not about say it's it's about making sure he understands its value so that if he ever did leave us yeah he understood his value yeah. Not and leaving us because we undervalued him, and then the next guy was going <laughs> to undervalue him just as much, but it was just better than what we were valuing. You know, it's like no, if if he went to go do something, it's because he understood his value here, and and, and we're showing it at 18 years old that he says, "Oh, this guy that I'm going, who's going to do blank, I'm going to be like, good. He sees where you what you could do with him, and that's how it ought to be." There's you know? a there's a hilarious story I heard from Craig Shell about like leadership development, and then his whole story was. What if we pour into all these young people and we develop them and they leave, right? And people were asking that question. He was like, well, the better question is, what if you don't develop them and they stay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, you, exactly. then you have exactly the kind of culture you didn't want. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's why you got to differentiate between the castle and the kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. You're building your castle, but always remember you're a part of the kingdom. So for me, even as I'm always discipling young people, at the end of the day, I'm telling myself they belong to the king. Yeah. They may be here for a season and maybe as much as I think they're serving me, serving the house or serving the industry or serving my business, the bigger thing that I'm, I'm also serving their future and I'm serving and sowing it to them for what God's called them to do in the And this kingdom. is a massive shift in leadership today, I'm telling you. In the, in the old days, um, if my boss... And by the way, nobody wants to be bossed anymore. So don't be a boss. <laughs> yeah. Well, be a boss, but don't yeah, boss yeah, yeah. people. But the old days, if I would have told my boss, hey, I've got seven different job offers, and I, I really, uh, um, or any kind of hint that I might be looking around or mm -hmm. thinking that this might be, not be my only place I'm ever going to work, mm. what, was, what was that conversation? You're fired. Yeah. Yeah. Or get, get out, out of here. here. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, the, the expe expectation of a young leader is that, no, please help coach me yeah. through this process. So it's what you're saying, Will. Mm -hmm. It's like my job as a leader today is to, is to develop somebody knowing that they probably will leave mm. and that it's, uh, I just get a season with them to make them the best expression, the truest version, you know, bring out the God wiring in them. Um, and then when they do have opportunities, yep. I'm here to coach and mentor them through that through that discussion mm -hmm. that's different that's a it's i'm a coach much more than i'm a manager mm. i'm a i'm a mentor much more than i am a boss and this just that premise of wait i can actually talk to the person who hired me and i can they can, they're going to actually give me advice on these other four things that somebody's offering to me mm -hmm. it's a whole different way to look at leadership for sure that, yeah one one other thing just on the on the discovering calling and and cuz i think this is always helpful is and I want to ask you guys or anybody else here, what was it as a child that you did that you, nobody told you, you you should or could? And when we start thinking about the intrinsic wiring that God put in us, so much of it is always evidenced as, is, as a kid. Mm -hmm. So for me, first grade, Mrs. Weaver's class, shout out, rural Oklahoma, 30 kids in the class. Day one of first grade, I learned everybody's name. Mm. Day two... I figured out there was two or three of those 30 that were sort of the ones that could make things happen on the playground. <laughs> By day five, I'm doing trade deals in the cafeteria. <laughs> now, nobody said to me, listen, Lamanek, when you go to first grade, yeah. you know, step one to influence is that you got to get to know everybody's name. And that was wiring God DNA yeah. in me. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge breadcrumb because I do the same thing today. I just do it differently. Yeah, but I'm yeah, it's I'm the still same concept. I'm still navigating that same gifting in me. Uh, but it was so evident early in my life where nobody paid me for it. Nobody was. I was trying to prove. So yeah, that's yeah. always helpful for people who go. I don't know. Well, you know, you know, you just haven't actually spent the time to think about it. Yeah, because it's just second nature to them. They're just second swimming nature. in water mm -hmm. as a fish. Yeah, yeah for sure. My I have two. Mine was in uh, third grade. Me and my brother wanted to start a clothing label, <laughs> Christian clothing label, which back then it was like only Jesus fish ones. Oh, yeah. And WWGD, we, yeah. we wanted to make angels that looked like Dragon Ball Z characters. Ooh. That was our clothing line. And so my brother would draw these like buffed out angels, like choking Satan, but like Dragon Ball Z anime style. And, and like this is like 
2001, 2002. So nut, nut stuff like that didn't exist. And so we went to my mom and we're like, we want to start Christian clothing. It's like, okay, work on the designs, blah, blah, blah. She takes us and sets us up a meeting with like a local clothing vendor. And like wow. the technology today didn't exist where you could scan something and edit it in Photoshop or whatever. And so the guy basically takes us back to his studio and shows us how shirts are made and basically shows us like, it's going to be very expensive and almost impossible to do what you guys want to do at, at 13 and 14 years old. And so then my mom takes me home and we build this graft of like cost and how much, how much does a screen print cost and how much does this ultimately us seeing the impossibility of it. But it was enough for me to go like, Oh, a dream isn't just as much as dreaming it. You also have to resource it. You also have to, it has to also be somewhat possible yep. or on the horizon. And so that was my first inception of like my mom, like, yeah, let's do it. Let's go to the screen ship pro place. So she believed in us enough to get us a seat at the table, but then was like, so do you guys think you have $3,000? And it was like, uh. no, she's like, well, if you really care about it and you really want to save, like that may, me and dad will help a little bit, but that that's how much it's going to cost. And then you're young. And so ultimately that fades into something else, but it was enough that it was like, okay, my parents believe in an entrepreneur spirit. They want to help in it, but they're also challenging me. I have to do it. So that's third grade or, or really maybe, yeah, yeah, about third or fourth grade. And then now sophomore year, I have a teacher who um, he, during Reese, like during our lunch breaks in, in high school, he, people who are in the local area would know him, Mr. Cataldo. He's like an OG. Shout out, he, Mr. Cataldo. He taught, because I know he's video listening. and film too, edits too. So he's the teacher over film and video at Rancho High our local high school, which I, I had studied. That's where my marketing background came from. So he had this fridge during recess that he would sell sodas after. It was a big fridge and it had a big freezer that he never used. So I said, hey, Mr. Cataldo, how much would it cost to rent out that freezer from you? Because you're not using it. And he goes, 20 bucks a month. I Done. said, bet. He jokingly goes, I... I want to make sure, because he goes, if you commit, you can't next month not do it anymore. You have to do it to the end of the year. I said, deal. So he goes, on, he pulls out a piece of paper and he goes, contract between Cataldo and Adam, 20 bucks a month till the end of the year, uh, every month for my freezer. Deal. I sign it. He signs it. I stock it with Otter Pops. <laughs> I sell two Otter Pops for 50 cents, one, 25 cents for an Otter Pop. You can get 200 in a case, which means I was making a hundred, but they're like, they're like 10 bucks. I'm making, I'm making a hundred bucks a box oh, yeah. and I'm selling about five cases Hello. a week at I think I made 500 bucks a month at $20 a month. Oh, he's like, man, let me, let me, let me second, redo that. By the second month, Catal says, I want to renegotiate. And I had, he, he scanned a copy. So I had a contract copy. He had a contract cause he's like a facetious guy. If you know him, he like, he was doing it more as a joke, but yeah, it was, sure. so then I hold it up and I said, Hey, we, we got he a contract it. buddy. Yeah. So it cost me that whole semester like 140 bucks to rent the freezer, and I made at least four thousand dollars, three thousand dollars. People would come out in between and they'd say, "Oh, hey, I want a soda, and you know, can I get four Otter Pops?" I'd be chilling in recess in the <laughs> classroom, and I started paying guys twenty bucks a week to be there when I wasn't to do the sales. That's what he's still doing. Oh, yeah. oh Otter Bro, Pop over here. Oh, Otter church Pop right here. Oh, Otter Pop, Otter Pop man. <laughs> and so, like you're saying, like to me, it's like if people it's are wiring. like, "Man, Adam, you're very entrepreneur." I'm like. Why well, my parents believed in it, and then also I I had an eye for it, and that's what I'm good at, you know, is that entrepreneur spirit. But to your point, like those are breadcrumbs. That's crumbs, exactly man. what it was. Breadcrumbs. Yeah. Yeah. Tra yeah. Trace your childhood. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And then it, it helps you land at your most authentic self, you know. Yeah. And then you want to live from the center, rather than the fringes. What was you know? what was your what was your childhood? Uh, it's all validation. This, this, the breadcrumb. The same, dude. I was junior you, junior high. I was taking bags of clothes during nutrition break. Y'all, did y'all have nutrition break? It's like a fifteen little minute break. I was selling. Were you all, in Korea at that time? Korea, the, yeah, no, US, we don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> we hey, have nutrition. No, no. Break. no by the way, I grew up on the U.S. military base. Yeah, nobody's nobody's school, taking the nutrition break. But I used to take like <laughs> bags of on a military <laughs> military base. <laughs> hey, bro. But I used to take like bags of clothes, and sell my clothes. Just, I just all the same. Everything I was doing when I was a kid, I'm just doing now in a different context. But I bet you were also probably some outlet of that you were you were in front of people. You were always. you were talking. Yeah, I was always you talking. were you were teaching or, or sharing. The you, one, you, the main thing is, I was always problem solving to commit crimes. So I was the kid <laughs> when we would go like steal something. 
yeah. or shoplift, I'll be like, all right, fam, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. You're going to stand here. Right. You're going to stand there. If they say this, you say this, this is probably what's going to happen. So yeah. have this and everything would just happen. Yeah. So my nickname was Nostradamus. So yeah. My friends will always say, how does this fool always know? So and I still do that at church executive Definitely. meetings. I'm like, look, oh, yeah. we're going to make this decision. And then this, here's, is gonna this is probably what's going to happen. If this does happen, here's plan A, B. My, my staff always says he has plans A through Z. It's uh-huh. like, this was, but that was all like, since I was a kid. Evidence. Yeah. So it's just, and God just redeems all those things. And we, many it's times great. we just don't give ourselves permission to actually lean in to, to those things that were so true about us. 100%. Because yeah. this is why so many people have midlife crises. Yes. Because they finally get to the place where they might discover or, or become aware of the thing that, like we're talking about, the, the sense of calling or more wiring. And then they can't pursue it because they've got all this other stuff they have to steward. Yeah. So they got three, three kids in college and they got a mortgage and they've got a car payment. It's like, well, do I want to pay dumb tax? Or do, you know, how do I navigate that? Well, you've got to be smart. But this is the challenge is many people discover it that they can't, they can't go chase it. I had a question for you, Brad, and even Adam or anyone else as well. And let me just say something about what you just said and I want to ask the question. Um, I, I like, we're, it's more of a recent thing I've been telling myself and even kind of like people I've been mentoring, like the faster you could stop pretending, the happier you'll be. And the faster you stop pretending, the sooner you'll find your calling. But obviously when you're younger, a lot of pressure, a lot of things you gotta do. One thing that I've been thinking about more recently, and I'm curious to hear what you have to say. I said earlier, in the early early years of your career development, it's about your yes. In yep. the middle and your latter years, it's about your no. And I saw you like nodding your head, like, being an you know a sage who has more experience. Am I, am I sage? You're a sage, you're a sage. bro. You're yeah, like yeah, you're come like, on, man. I'm not that old. I'm not, I'm not beyond sage. sage. I'm not old enough to be a sage. You talk, you broke. Talk. You broke five zero. <laughs> sage. Man, you, just, you call me out. <laughs> I don't know everybody. Gift, man. The fact everybody. that we all think that you're 40 in our head, okay, like that's good. a gift. Good. That's I, a gift. I've been having like friends who are under 30s getting Botox, and I'd be looking at them as I, w- I want my wrinkles because I want to show people. Is all it is. <laughs> yeah, I own this, yeah. you know. Scars. Tell, yeah. tell me about talking to someone like me or Adam, the power of no yeah. at a certain stage of your career calling and leadership. Yeah. Like why is no so important well, to no, get to? And no is not, it's not impolite. It's polite. No, no means that I know, I know, K-N-O-W. No means no. Mm. And not, N-O means K-N-O-W. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm saying no because I know what my lane is, what my sweet spot is, what I'm good at, what, I mean, all, put all those, put all those Lego pieces onto that. Mm. And, and it gives you, it gives you clarity, but it also gives you the freedom to then pursue your best yes. Mm. So no, saying no means that you're moving towards your best yes. Mm. When you're early, you're just trying to figure out a yes that might lead towards another yes. But at some point, you you know <laughs> That's good. you know you're you know you're the right yes, and now you're saying no to get to make sure you're just staying true to your best yes. Mm. So I know what my lane is now, and I say I now here's the difference. Some people say some people like to feel like they can say no because it gives them power. Well, that's dumb. <laughs> so stop doing that. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, I'm really busy, and you got to go through my 17 assistants. And yeah, I've yeah. got I'll like check my calendar. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I I've got so much I don't have anything on. until nine months from now. Stop. Stop yeah. with all that. Yeah. Um, we know you're not doing anything tomorrow. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I I do appreciate clarity from people. So uh, because. If they're saying no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that they're saying no because they, they're not saying no to me mm. or no to other I, things I might invite them to. They're just saying no to this one, mm. right? Um, but the, the, the greatest thing for people in the later years of their life is, again, to do the thing that only they can do in that season. Mm. So, mm-hmm. you know... The more I get closer to that, I just I'm, I have clarity, and yeah. so I'm I'm gonna stay in that lane. Yeah, Here, what I tend to do is follow up. If I if I hear a no from somebody, what I'll tend to say is I'll say um, if it would be in your interest level at all 
would you be open to me sending you four or five okay. dates? Okay, this is different. That work with your schedule. <laughs> this is different. And, and because I've learned that, you know, high capacity lever, leaders, if you just say, hey, we got this thing on April 2nd, uh, could you come and do it? And they say, no, I can't. You don't know whether they want to do it or they do want to do yeah. it. They just, they know their space. They know their time. So, so what I tend to do, number one, I've learned I just don't, set dates unless it's a specific thing I'm asking for a conference or whatever. Other than that, I'll say, would you ever have any interest mm. working with our staff, coming in and sit down? And if so, if you are interested in it all, could I send you four or five dates um, that you could let me know they work or just send me a date that work for you and I'll, and I'll see if our team can work around That's it. so good. And then if they say, uh, no, then I, then I go, okay, we're just not in the sphere of what you're interested to do right now. But what tends to happen is they'll say, yeah, I think I could do And Figure I go, even if it's next year, yeah. I, I'm good. But would that hap would that be okay, right? And then to me, usually that's where you get the yes, yes. that also comes. And then I say, and then I, and then I just, I, I remove the elephant in the room and I say, and if there is a fee usually associated, can you just tell it to me on the front end? Cause I don't want to waste your time. And I'll let you know right away if, if that works for us. And if it doesn't, then I respect, cause sometimes what they'll say is like, maybe, but then I, I don't know if you'll even pay what I, what you, I need to pay or, the, or they may say, I don't have a fee. I believe in what you're doing. I'm just not available right mm -hmm. now. And I go, Oh man, Thank you so and there, much. And there's, you know, there's so much um, value. What, what, what you're saying, Adam, is you're you're actually removing the barriers that many people might allow for that that either to be ignored or you know you never get an answer. And the question of well, how do I actually get somebody who I would love to participate in my thing, or I want to invite them into something, or I'm I want to connect with them. Like this is a question a lot of people have: is how do I how do I connect with somebody who is a hero? Mm. that I'm, I'm really afraid, if I'm honest, to reach out to them. And the idea of keep it brief, yeah. <laughs> brevity is beautiful. If you're sending an email, let's just say, uh, you want to honor them to start with. You want to tell them what, what you're asking for. You want to give them an out, meaning the out is, hey, you, I know you're, you know, you, you probably don't say yes to all this stuff, so no, no sweat if it doesn't work. And I just, I want to always give people the out compared to people will email me and they'll say, they'll, they'll immediately start with, with I'm a big deal, which mm -hmm. that's one strike against you. Yeah. The second strike is, uh, I'd like for you to mentor me weekly. Yeah. <laughs> that's the second strike. The third strike is, and if you don't, I'm going, I'm, they're not saying this, but if you don't, I'm going to tell all my friends that you're really not that interested in, in mentoring the next generation. Mm. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, you just put me in a yeah. real pickle here in yeah. the corner. Compared to, hey, love your book. That chapter seven was amazing. I implemented some things from that. Um, could I ask you to, I'm going to, would it be okay if I emailed you next Tuesday and ask you one question? Mm. And by the way, no pressure if I never hear from you. I'm still going to love you. I'm going to tell my friends to go buy your book. And I'm yeah. going to be, I'm, you know, whatever I can do to help you. Mm -hmm. Boy, that, those two differences right there, I'll respond to that, that one. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I do that. I'll do that. Like, uh, Jabin Chavez always gets mad at me because I'll text him and I'll say, hey, any time today, I have three questions. I'll do it under 15 minutes if there's any today, tomorrow, or sometime this week. And then he always calls me right away and he goes, you don't have to do that. You're my friend. You can call me anytime and I'll pick up the phone. I said, man, I just respect how busy you are. And, I, and I'm not, I'm not, and my personality type isn't like that. I'm, I'm not a chitter chatter guy. So right. I'm like, trust me. If I look up to you, well, I'm gonna mouth. I'm gonna take less than 20 minutes mm -hmm. to talk to you. If 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 you give me time on the phone, or I'll text uh, Pastor Lee Doming and I'll say one question you can answer with one word. Do you think it would be beneficial if we do X, Y, and Z? And sometimes he'll go yes, or other times he'll say just call me. You know, I'm like okay. But I'm, I want to always respect. I never want to take for granted. For sure that if I value someone's wisdom and they've given me the opportunity to have their cell phone number or I even have access to their assistant, whatever it may be, I'm never, and I'll never ask someone that I haven't spent hours talking to, to even remotely consider mentoring me. I mean, in my head, I would have to have been around you for at least 20 hours, not at one time, but consecutive, like at least been an opportunity to have gone to three, four conferences, you know, four or five 
lunches with 20 guys where you at least gave me some time that I would even go, I might ask that person. And normally I'll put like a time on it. I'll be like, can you give me the next 90 days or six months? Um, and like, I'm talking, talk to me three times and I'll be good. Like, yeah. I'm just looking for some for intentional sure. at, rather than I think so many of us think that someone who is successful is the unlocking mechanism to our next season. And so we just think that person ought to pour into me, but, uh, because I am the next thing, like not thing, just next generation, right? I'm the next generation. If, and if that person values the next generation, they'll, they don't, they'll, they don't believe in me. Yeah. No, they're just busy. <laughs> They'll give me one hour a week. I'm like, man, my my sons would be lucky and blessed to have one hour a week at unintentional. I know that's not popular, but like my sons would love that. So the fact that you think you're going to get that just out of thin air, Bro, have, it's not. <clears throat> you have to approach, and there is a way to approach it, right? For sure. Uh, and there are other people with me, like even in our church, they are faithful every single week. And they come every week, sit in service. They're always just an encouragement. And they come and they go, hey, I'd love to meet with you one day. And I go, oh, we're going to do it in the next 48 hours. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. yeah. you have ne you have been you here. You have been here for seven years. Yeah. And you have been showing up. Yeah. Whereas someone shows up on the first day and goes, hey, I'm thinking about joining here, but we got to have lunch before that happens. And I'll be like... Yeah, it's like they're walking in with a if, sandwich board on. If I could do it, I'd do it. neon flashing but sign. It's just, says, I'm sorry, that's not going to happen. Should, you know? I'm a big deal. Dude, I have, I'd like to do I have that. so but much it, to say about this. I think because our, our occupation is unique because yeah. we're... Oh, everybody wants everybody wants to be mentored by, by Pastor Will and Pastor Adam. No, but my point was like people think <laughs> pastors just prepare sermons. Yeah, well, that's not what you right? do. I thought that's all you <laughs> or, did all week. Or if they come from a smaller church, pastors just help people. Not knowing there is so many other elements to yeah. leading an organization and making decisions and being a dad and having yeah. a wife and having For kids sure. and I have so much to say about this, but it's just like, and I'll say, and I'll say on top of that, it is, a, I count it an honor and a blessing anytime ever, anyone ever thinks that I'd be mentor. Absolutely. Already. For sure. I, I am, 100%. I am, and I think by when you tell people no, for some reason, people think that you don't, like you take that for granted or yeah. you, sure. like me and Ashley, because of our, our Beyond I Do podcast, I mean, we have hundreds of people requesting one-on-one -on -one mentorship. And it's like, me and Ashley are, are absolutely blown away that even one person would even let, want that. But that also doesn't, uh, give it the room that we're going to allow that to just completely compress all of our time. Sure. Um, and I, so I think people have to remember if you ask someone to mentor you and they say no, um, now they may take it for granted, but yeah. many would it, they, they, they counted an absolute yeah. honor that you would even ask, for sure. but it's just not in the cards yeah. and one of for the, many reasons. One of the things know? that's been helpful for me to communicate, and I heard this from Peter Scuzzero, you know, because a lot of times people approach me and say, hey, pastor, I know you're busy, but... Yeah, that, that line. Yeah, I, but now I just line. stop them. I say, hey, I'm actually not busy. I'm limited. Like, I'm, I, I'm limited, yeah. right? My life yeah. is healthy. I have margin intentionally. I'm trying to be a present husband, I'm trying to be a good coworker, so I'm not on the fringes of my life. And I just want you to know I'm just limited, mm -hmm. and I have one body, same amount of time as you do. So I just want you to know mm -hmm. as much as I would want to, I need to embrace my limitations, and that's my way of honoring you, honoring myself, and honoring my family and God. Yeah, right? structured. You could say limited, structured, disciplined. Yeah, for sure. You know, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm habitual. Yeah. But yeah. Busy, busy is not necessarily... Yeah. Busy means many times I'm frantic. Yeah. 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 And there's a difference between every minute being taken to the point that every minute is valued. And, and those are hey, two different, you sure. know, when people are like, I know you're really busy. I'm like, I mean, it depends on how you, how you do it. I do have a lot on my plate, but in busy, if you think I wake up in the day and I'm constantly moving without a second of space. Yeah. No, I, I have space. For sure. I have space for rest. I have space that I sit down and have a cup of coffee. I sit down and have lunch with my wife and we look at each other across the table. My life is not rushed mm. in the way that you think, but every minute does matter. For sure. So if you're going to take a minute from me. It has to have either a natural ROI or like Pastor Lee Domingue says, an EROI, mm -hmm. an eternal reward. I'll make space all day for, for an sure. eternal reward of investment, but it has to matter. Like yeah. in a church setting, it's like, have you, have you gone through the systems of discipleship in the church that we have meticulously tried to form to help you find your calling and purpose? No, I haven't. I've never gone to a small group. 
Uh, I've never gone through growth track. <laughs> I've never, I, I, I go to church once a month and, but I, I need a meeting with you. I'm going yeah. to be like, I'm sorry. You, you have, you haven't even shown that you're good soil to even Hello. water at this point. Mm-hmm. But to that person who comes and they're like, I see them every day when I get out the car, they got their volunteer shirt on. They're in the parking lot, whatever. They always a smile. And they come and they just go, pastor, I'm going through it in my marriage. I, I, I just, I need a little wisdom. Like, take my cell phone number. For sure. I see you mm-hmm. here every week. Take my, I just know you're so busy. No, this is my job right now. Sure. This moment is my job. Like, For sure. but this mattered in this moment because of how much you have poured into this walk here's, and you have poured into this here's thing. Here's the lesson so around it's available. that. Again, yeah. practical. The lesson right there <clears throat> is show up, be faithful, have proximity, create space where people notice that you're in it for the long haul. Yeah. And you you will get influence over that time. Yeah. And this yeah. is true in a company, it's true in a church, true in any environment, true in friendships. Yeah. yeah. And so many times we show up and we short we we want to fast forward. And even to your to yeah. your example, at some point we start thinking, well, I deserve. Yeah. Be careful. Yeah. You I'm don't owed. deserve. I'm, I'm owed. owed. I'm owed. Yeah. Yeah. Be careful. It's, be it's careful. Payday. Yeah. yeah. I mean, be yeah. careful. Even thinking yeah. about your it's book, great. right? It's are you hungry? Do you hustle? And are you humble? So even for me, I think about I'm very grateful for my father in law. Um, he's my spiritual father, and I credit all my leadership. The foundation is him, right? And one thing he'd do, he never sat and had lunch with me. He was running this direction, <laughs> and this is good and bad. If I could keep up, keep up. Yes. As long as I could keep up, yeah, it was spilling on me like Elijah to Elisha, yeah. right? Yeah. He's like, if you're here when I go up, you're gonna get my mantle. Meaning, you better stick next to me as close as you can, and right. you're gonna get an impartation, not just information, right? Yes. So, my father-in-law, he would preach, and I'll be watching him. He'd be like, oh, you hear it? Go give your testimony. <laughs> it's like, what? It's like, right now, you're going up right now. Blah, yeah. blah, blah. After I'm done, he's like, you should have said this. You should have said this. You shouldn't have said this. I'm, I'm getting discipleship. I'm getting mentorship. I'm being developed. Yeah. And as long as I could keep up, I was, I was growing. And oftentimes, I find people, you got to, like you said, you got to have the soil for someone yeah. to want yeah. to pour into. So you got to do your part, right? Do your yeah. part. Get up, of, keep up, and shut up. <laughs> Yeah, my, my dad. My dad had always said uh, in staff. He said, "You don't have to run my pace, but don't ever let me lap you." Hey. And he said, "If I lap you, we'll have problems." <laughs> That's a crazy quote. <laughs> yeah. He said, "You and I only have a problem if I lap you." <laughs> so he said, "That's it. You don't have to keep my pace. Just don't let me lap you." Yeah. And I like everybody be like, "Okay." And I will yeah. say one, one other thing about that too is like, if you <laughs> happen to work for someone yeah. who's more task oriented, because there's yeah. personalities. There are people who are task oriented and people who are more relation relationship oriented. If your supervisor or your boss or your manager tends to be more task oriented, but you're looking for relationships, give that person grace and be like, right. they're actually trying their best to be relational. And what you don't know is like, they're not actually gifted towards that, right? And so for me, that's been also a constant struggle of mine that I'm always, I'm always wrestling with because yeah. my values are very relational. My convictions are very pastoral. My personality is like, give me a mountain, we're going to climb this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like with my yeah. nails bleeding, we're going to climb it. And as long as you're willing to climb with me, we're going to have a relationship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I've had to wrestle through that and I've been yeah. called out. Like people yeah. will call me out and say, yo, Pastor, you're so task oriented. Can you like be there for me? And yeah. I have to be all right, just, just give me some grace. Give me back s- a little bit. Yeah, yeah, give me some grace. You know add, value. I mean? add value, add value, yeah. add value. I mean, John Maxwell. The, yeah. one, the one thing, I mean, I learned a lot working around John and with John. The one thing, though, that still is so, it's so transferable to any leader, any person listening, add value. If you walk into any environment and you add more value than you take, or you just add value because you're for somebody else, you're just always thinking, even in a mentoring relationship, mm-hmm. how do I add value to the point where this person can't not have me around? For sure. They, they, they have to have me For with sure. them because I'm just I adding- I water bottle to my father. Here's the water. You need yeah. water? <laughs> just add value. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, again, let's go back to Andy. Yeah. Because Andy's, he's adding value when he's showing up just editing for free. Yeah. Add yeah. value. If yeah. you add value, you win. 
All right, well, I'm going to land the plane there. It's uh, 2.30. we got to go do a staff meeting <laughs> with the staff. They're waiting now. So I've been, I've been squeezing Brad all oh, day. On, He's man. been with our lead team this morning and podcast, and then, and then now it's our staff I saw, meeting. I so, saw everybody starting uh, to scramble. Yeah, they're yeah. starting to go head they over were, to the staff. No, like everybody's, you know, giving you the sign here. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. because of my ADHD, they have to, uh, they give me 30, 30 minute increment oh. heads up. Yeah, wrap, just so yeah. I know. And they're the, different what's colors. What's the rap? What's the, what's the, is it? Is There's it, no rap. No, but I mean, is it, what's the oh, sign? Oh, it's normally this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we don't have rap. Basically, it's just, see, she has <laughs> 5, 15, 30, <laughs> Literally, 30, 15, yeah, yeah, and yeah, 5. Five, yeah. 5. What about, yeah. What about, uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah different Where, Where's colors. the sign that says this stinks right go now? Go home. Yeah. The, the, your no, mic just cuts. Yeah. Go in a point. different direction. It just cuts. Yeah. No, that's yeah. usually one of the producers goes on and goes, I have a TikTok video I want you guys to comment on. You know it's bad. Let's change the pace. <laughs> you know it's bad when the TikTok, the TikTok video yeah. gets announced. Yeah. Sometimes we do it for to launch our con- like launch a conversation. Other times it's like it's like, hey, this room's dry. Let's, let's throw a video on here to get everybody back back in the the scroll feed right now. Well, it's nice to meet everybody yeah. listening. I, yeah. I'm 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 a fan of the podcast. First first long time listener, first time caller. Yeah. So and it's, it's good a, to be on. It's an honor Always. to have you on. It yeah. just it's a big deal for us to have you with us today. So thank you, Brad. And everybody, uh, uh, Brad has two incredible books, Catalyst Leader, uh, Humble, Hungry, Hustle, which we just had our whole leadership team read, and they absolutely loved it. I know some of you, some people watch this volunteer in our church. Some of our leads have had some of their volunteers read it and are already loving it. And then Brad has his own leadership podcast. You're already he, listening to podcasts, so yeah, jump in on that other one. Brad, Brad brings on some of the most gifted individuals, not just in the faith-based space, but just in leadership and culture. And Why have so, we not had Will um, Chung or Adam Mesa on yet to this point? We ain't made it yet. Mm-hmm. We're still not there. We're still, we're still in the water. We're still in the We're still in the soil right now. <laughs> y'all are, y'all are on, the, uh, you're on the discovery list. Me and Will want to be on together. We're, we're <laughs> dynamic duo. Yes, y'all sir. Y'all are Ebony and Ivory. Exactly. Cheech and Chung. Cheech and Chung. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're from this city, Rancho Cucamonga. Yeah. That's a throwback right there. Yeah. Everybody under 40 right now is like, who's Cheech like, and Chong? What? Yeah, that's, they're, oh, they're from this. They're from Rancho Cucamonga. So uh, it's uh, H3 Podcast, Leadership Podcast, yeah, right? H3 the podcast. Leadership Podcast. Yeah, yep. H3 Leadership Podcast. It's one, it's one of my dad's top three. So if you like Pastor Diego's leadership type of stuff, it's Carrie Newhoff, it's Brad Lominick, and... Uh, you know, ascent leader Sean Morgan, which oh. is another one of my mentors. Shout out, yeah. shout out, Sean Morgan. Sean Morgan, out. We'll get him on here one shout of these out. days. So, thanks everybody. God bless. Bye. Peace.